Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Moyer. I'm a postdoc at MIT CSAIL, and today I'll be talking to you about harmonization. So we're all at the DiPy workshop. We're familiar with MR data, MR images. Um, this is a T1. Maybe we would like diffusion better, but uh, we're all familiar with uh, data in the center. And as scientists, we also usually have labels, so diagnoses, phenotypes, uh, maybe genotypes even, um, that we want to associate with our image data. So we want to learn the associations between brain images or other target images and, and our labels. And we, alongside this, we have a scanner context, um, which I'll represent with colors here. And the scanner context, we, in, at least in small studies, don't really have control over. We only have one scanner, so we don't really think about it. Um, it doesn't really matter as much because we can't change anything about it. But if we're, as studies get larger, or if we're lucky enough to have multiple uh, sites as collaborators, we might end up with a multi-scanner context, um, multiple site contexts, where um, variations in the, in the scanning equipment uh, can influence the images. Um, so essentially, we have variations in our, in our image signal by site. And these site signals don't generalize because we know that uh, going into one scanner or another doesn't actually, doesn't causally change your, your phenotype, hopefully. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't change your genotype by, by going into a Siemens versus a, a Philips scanner. Um, so associations there have to be incidental, right? That we either are doing a retrospective study or we messed up on our, on our patient scheduling or our blocking, our subject blocking, and we accidentally sent more subjects of one type to one scanner than another, or we maybe couldn't have geographic constraints or something. Um, either way, we, we want to correct for this, and harmonization is the process of doing that correction. So a little bit about why these, these variations exist. Um, different magnets, different coils are different. Uh, vendors, so you know Siemens, Philips, GE, uh, they all have different, slightly different images for the same contrast, the same uh, label on the contrast, uh, T1 or T2 or diffusion, they're going to produce slightly different images and sometimes actually very different images. Um, the different softwares for reconstruction, so even within a vendor, um, if you're in different versions, um, they're going to do slightly different reconstruction or it's slightly different acquisition even. Um, and of course, in retrospective or, or uh, clinical work, we might actually have protocol differences. So the parameters of the scan that are controlled by the technician are, are slightly different between the different subjects. Um, some other effects that you might not be aware of, scanner drift. So even the same scanner with the same hardware, it will slightly change over time. Um, this is through use, through the hysteresis of the magnet. Um, yeah, that uh, if you scan a phantom today and you scan that same phantom a year from now on the same scanner, you'll get slightly different images. Um, scanner upgrades. So many of us don't have control over the maintenance cycles of our, of our scanning site. And if a, tech, if a vendor technician comes in and upgrades the scanner or performs maintenance, this can also change the images. Um, and of course, if we don't have control over the, the site, uh, that's okay, but we may not also have control over clinical scheduling. So for, for patients, um, they may schedule all patients of one type on a specific scanner, and that will induce correlations, right? So for diffusion in particular, uh, I usually don't include this slide because it can get really tedious, but uh, for the DiPi workshop, I think it's really important. Um, back in, what, 2005-ish, uh, we started looking at uh, a lot of these diffusion measures in the large studies. They started including them in their prospective designs. And that meant that because of the geometrically increasing number of diffusion measures, we ended up with a also increasing number of studies for how the diffusion measures change um, between different sites. Um, a couple of years ago, we, uh, the Mackay CDMRI people um, started hosting a, a challenge about this. So they would purposefully collect traveling phantom human subject 
on uh, four or five different scanners for five different scanning contexts. And uh, we would try and harmonize them or find algorithms that are best at, at, at removing these site-wise variations. Um, and at the last one of these, or well, I guess several years now, uh, one of my collaborators, Alicia Zhu, collected a large number of the, uh, the studies into a large table, uh, the giant table, um, describing how uh, different parameter changes in diffusion changed, uh, or either parameter changes in diffusion or parameter changes in the scanner changed the output summary diffusion metrics. Um, this is a slightly dated now because obviously we have more diffusion metrics and also because uh, there have been more studies about it. But yeah, this is all to say that the scanner variability problem occurs in diffusion um, and is something that we're forced to think about if we do multi-site studies. Okay, yeah, so we're going to talk today about uh, three things. First, we'll go through post hoc corrections, so statistical analyses for those of us who are doing things where we need a confidence interval at the end of the day, or p-values. Um, we'll talk about how to do this in our linear analyses or near linear analyses. Um, and then we'll talk about, in the second part, how to do this for machine learning models, so deep networks. Uh, many of these techniques also transfer to other machine learning models. And then for a little bit at the end, we'll talk about open problems and meta problems in harmonization. Yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, of course, the easiest solution, the zeroth order solution, is to not have harmonization problems at all. So only use one scanner or plan ahead. Um, this doesn't reduce all of your variation, but uh, as UK Biobank and, and Adney have shown that th this can help you a lot by getting everybody on the same page, or even in UK Biobank's case, only using one site and two closely paired scanners. Um, yeah, so if you can do this, do it. But if you can't, linear site effects. Um, what do I mean by a linear site effect? Uh, so on the left, we have labels and, and scanner contexts. And on the right, we have an image from which we want to extract relationships between labels and images. And on the far right, we have the model, which uh, the linear model, which we usually use to, to do this. Um, we have written out all the covariates. So we have X and beta, which are the variable of interest, and then the XI, which are these other covariates, maybe sex and age and intracranial volume confounders, maybe. Um, and then alongside this, we have a, a site effect beta star, right? So we usually do this by region um, or, or maybe in voxel, voxel-wise analyses. And Beta star is the scanner effect. Uh, we'll fit these all using ordinarily squares. So again, beta star being the scanner effect, if beta star is non-zero, or so if, essentially if we have a detectable uh, uh, effect by which scanner we're on in the linear sense, then we have linear scanner or side effects. Um, standard ANOVA is a, is a great test here. Um, or, or variations on Mankova, essentially. Uh, but also there are graphical tests. These originate mostly from uh, genomics or other omics, um, but there's Bland-Altman or the MA plot. Um, and both of those can be used to, to show graphically um, that there are side effects. Right, so if we've already fit our OLS regression, so we fit the regular least squares, and we're saying beta star is the scanner effect, then haven't we, uh, like you might be saying, we've already corrected for side effects by including them as a covariate. And, and you would be right, actually, right? Fixed effects models, so regular OLS models with uh, you know, dummy variables for every site, that's perfectly fine. That, that is a good way of doing business. We can do better um, for linear or near linear models, um, but it, it's okay. I want to say this: it's okay to do fixed effects. What would be one more step further? So we have the same linear model in the center. Um, S is the same site design matrix, so assigning each subject to each site correctly. Um, but 
what if beta star were now draws from a joint distribution, uh, non like a zero mean Gaussian, for example. And now associations between sites are the co the covariance of that Gaussian. So this is uh, what's called mixed effects or random effects. Um, and essentially, if, if the covariance is diagonal, we're, we're, we're regularizing beta star by a, by a Gaussian prior. But if we have uh, more information, like, oh, we think Siemens sites, even with different head coils, should be more similar than uh, GE sites, um, we can also encode that into, into phi, the, uh, the covariance matrix. And we're forced to assume that our, our fixed effects are uh, our X design matrix and our, our side effects are uncorrelated. So that we added one more assumption. Um, this is usually called random effects and the, the concatenation of the fixed effects, the covariates and the, the side effects, the random effects is called mixed effects in the literature. Um, this can also be called random intercepts. Um, and there are a lot of terms from this from other fields as well. Right. So you can do this straight out of the box in R and in, in Python. Um, LME4 and NMLE are two competing uh, packages that are both great for this. Um, stats models in Python, I think, is the cutting edge currently. Um, it only does diagonal phi, but uh, for our purposes, that's pretty good. And of course, uh, a lot of statisticians, including uh, neuroimaging statisticians, have produced uh, content about this because it's a pretty common model. Uh, Jeanette Mumford um, has a, a YouTube series on this that's really good. Um, it's in an fMRI context, so some of it doesn't apply, but it's still very helpful. Um, the LME4 author has a, a whole book on this. Um, of course, it's written from a stats perspective, but it's also very helpful to look at. And there are a couple of nice blog posts out there with like graphical representations of what's going on. Um, yeah, there's also a lot of uh, content for a more general model called random slopes, which might be helpful. Um, so if you're Googling things, random slopes is, uh, it's very similar, but uh, it includes the cases which diffusion imaging doesn't usually have. So repeated measures of the same subject. We, we usually only have one diffusion scan per subject. So yeah. Um, but one more step further that uh, we found of, has been helpful is combat. Uh, is an, it's, that's a model title. Um, and it was originally introduced in genomics in 2007. Um, but uh, Jean-Philippe Fortin in 2017 introduced this uh, for neuroimaging and, and also for diffusion measures. So he was doing DTI measures. Um, and what it does is, well, it still has the same covariate X beta plus uh, random effect S beta. Those are uh, random shifts, and then it includes random scales of the error uh, of the error vector. So this is a random shift and scale regression. Um, it otherwise is very similar. So it's in the same class of hierarchical models with uh, with random effects, and you can fit it with a very similar method. Um, there are both R and Python implementations, and in general, it tends to work. Um, so this this is. Uh, uh, even though it sounds very simple, or at least it doesn't sound like deep learning and all, all this crazy other stuff, for, for p-value analyses, this is what I would use currently. Um, this is what I recommend to you. And you can go further than this easily, but uh, this is like a, a nice baseline to start with. Uh, why, why would you do this overall? Um, yeah, you know, why not just use fixed effects? Because then you could just avoid thinking about anything. Overall, mixed effects, random effects are provably more efficient. So as long as you meet the assumptions, we'll have smaller confidence intervals. They also allow for more complex statistical structures. So um, because we know that Siemens scanners uh, with shared head coils, even though they're different magnets, they will be very similar compared to GE scanners or, or Phillips scanners, right? Because we know about these hierarchical or these ont ontological structures, we can encode that into uh, 
into our covariance matrix. So this is very helpful sometimes. Um, there's a whole literature in stats, uh, in applied stats, uh, about doing hierarchical linear models. Um, and then SEM above that. And yeah, you can go down that rabbit hole pretty far. And so uh, maybe you find that useful. Um, it also acts as a regularizer. So in general, regularizing your models is good. And this is one more regularizer. Um, the Gaussian prior, for example, was a, an L2 regularizer. And also, if your reviewer knows about it, if your reviewer is me, um, you know, maybe not the combat harmonization, but the mixed effects models, uh, they may just ask you to do it because it's it's really simple in R. Really, you know, it's two lines and it's similar in Python, you know, of four to five lines of, of code and you can produce the same analysis, but with random effects instead of uh, uh, fixed effects. So, but also there are reasons not to do this and one of the main reasons is that it requires your your site variables and your phenotype variables to be uncorrelated. And if that's not true, then um, you're actually misspecifying the model. And so bad things will happen in your stats. Um, it has a more involved fitting. So your regular fit diagnostics don't really work here. Um, so even though we kind of abstract over it and we just use the Python package. If something goes wrong in there, it's harder to debug. Also, yeah, you're going down toward hierarchical modeling. So this can get into a dark world where you have to go to hierarchical modeling conferences or, or submit to other journals, right? And you might not want to do that. That might not be part of the academic literature that you want to deal with. Um, and maybe your reviewers don't understand it, um, which can happen. And so then you're forced to use uh, fixed effects. And well, yeah, that's, that's the end of the story because, um, well, we'll talk about it in part three. And, and I guess this is an important part, like the statistical tests change. So there is something to be said for simplicity in our analyses, in our, in our p-value analyses. And we're using slightly different p-value estimators. So this might make people suspicious. Um, uh, yeah, so the p-values are weird. So one reason to not use it is you just want to do t-tests essentially. But does it work? This is from Artemis uh, Zaviangos Patroplu, um, a collaborator of mine uh, whose name I have just butchered. Um, and this is from the ADNI3 perspective uh, data set. And essentially she applied combat uh, among a large number of other methods to try and see which ones would do the harmonization best uh, in, in diffusion measures and combat works really well. Um, yeah, so these are all the different white matter or these are a large number of white matter regions um, and the D values, so the Cohen's D, uh, so normalized effect size by site and then before on the left and after on the right. As you can see on the right, after does pretty well. Um, there's still a, an effect, a significant effect actually in the CST. Um, so it's significant under um, ANOVA, but uh, it got most of the other regions correct. Actually, all the other regions correct. Yeah, so combat is what I have for you for, uh, <laughs> for corrections. If you want to go beyond this, there is a very large literature. Um, and reviewer one will ask you, like, why are you going further? Um, it's because they want a simple, explainable result. I don't think it's a bad thing to keep going, right? It, you should explore it. Um, but I have to warn you that it might be hard to do the clean scientific analyses with much more complex hierarchical models. On the other hand, you will juice up more and more power. So this is a good thing. And I think it overall eventually will, as a field, embrace these more complex uh, hierarchical models. But for now, combat 2017, 14, uh, 14 um, it is a pretty good solution for postdoc analyses. Yeah, let's move on to part two about machine learning.